Welcome to the webinar on an integrated approach to managing yellow margin leaf beetle in crucifer crops on organic farms. I'm your host, Alice Formiga, from the eOrganic Community of Practice at eExtension. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a very quick overview of today's program. The presentation will last about 45 minutes, and following that, we'll have 30 minutes for your question. We'll be reading the questions out loud after the presentation is over, and we will answer as many as we, as we can in the time we have. So today, I'm very glad to welcome um, some of the team members of a NIFA OREI project on organic integrated pest management of crucifer crops in the south. Elena Rhodes, Ramohan Balusu, and Ayanava Majumdar. Dr. Ramohan Balusu is a research fellow at Auburn University. He works on ecologically based pest management tactics in fruit and vegetable crops, and he's been working on yellow margin leaf beetle in organic crucifer production since 2006. Dr. Ayanava Majumdar is an extension entomologist with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, and his work focuses on developing vegetable IPM recommendations for a variety of crops. He's also the SARE program coordinator at Auburn University, and he has established a strong organic educational program for small producers in Alabama. Dr. Elena Rhodes is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Florida, where she specializes in integrated pest management in small fruit and vegetable crops. Her current major projects include the management of yellow margin leaf beetle in coal crops and blueberry gall midge in blueberries. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to our first speaker, Ayanava Majumdar. Thank you, Alice, and welcome everyone to this uh, eOrganic webinar. I'm very thankful to Alice for organizing this, and uh, I will begin by saying that this is really a more advanced uh, discussion uh, presentation. If you're interested in some of the basic biology of the pest we're talking about, um, you can always look at the archived webinar uh, that we did last year on December 2nd, 2014, um, on the eOrganic e website, and uh, we'll give you some more uh, information today uh, about the basic biology, but that's a good archive presentation. Uh, so we're going to go into this or, uh, more advanced discussion today and really focus on uh, trap cropping, uh, really multiple pest control tactics for yellow margin leaf beetle, like trap crops. Um, we'll also talk about monitoring system that is being developed, and um, uh, we'll talk about some of the natural enemies and uh, biorationals. Um, let me remind everyone that the uh, basic objectives of this ODI uh, grant, which was um, led by Auburn University uh, uh, by Dr. Henry Fathomero, uh, the main objective was to develop a real integrated strategy, uh, and you'll hear that today, and uh, I think you will enjoy that. Uh, but also, besides the research, have a very intensive educational program for producers. And you will hear that from me later uh, in, in this uh, presentation. Um, let me go to the next slide. Um, I think it just, OK, there we go. Yes, it's working, Alice. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk, um, after I'm done here, I'm going to quickly uh, hand it over to Dr. Rhodes at University of Florida. And she's going to talk about some of the basic biology of the insect and the IPM strategies that they have tried, uh, then followed by um, Dr. Balasu, who is going to talk about uh, the monitoring systems that they're developing, trap crops, and also some advanced biorational insecticide tests uh, that have been completed. Um, and eventually, uh, the presentation is going to come back to me for the overall IPM recommendations for the yellow margin leaf beetle. And uh, I'll try to synthesize all that uh, for, for producers and educators listening to this presentation. I just wanted to give you another reminder, uh, if you're a producer or an educator, uh, there is a very nice system of, uh, of working, uh, developing IPM strategies on your farm. And that includes uh, the three levels of pest management. Level one is the systems-based practices. And you will actually hear about um, uh, a discussion about sanitation. You'll also hear a lot about track crops, which, which are these level one practices. Uh, level two practices, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, this project did not. Uh, focus on this, but there is the um, 
the, the mechanical and physical practices is also a, a nice way to keep insects away. And then the third one, which will be another big focus of this presentation, is the use of biorational insecticides. And again, uh, you know, insecticides should be used in the organic system as the last resort. So just wanted to uh, give this information. And, um, and as you hear, think about the creative ways you can use these, these technologies that you're going to hear about on your farm. Uh, with this, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Dr. Rhodes from University of Florida, uh, who's going to talk about IPM strategies. All right. Well, good afternoon to most of you, except for you Pacific folks. I work down at the University of Florida and conducted a preliminary trial implementing the IPM strategy that we come up with for the yellow margin leaf beetle. All right, this doesn't want to, oh, there it goes, yay. This is the yellow margin leaf beetle. It's a major problem in organic crucifer production in the south. These beetles and their larvae are feasting on a young mustard plant in my colony that would, well, in a few days end up looking like the plant behind it. They're not a huge problem in conventional production because they're susceptible to a lot of the insecticides that are sprayed to control other things, but in organic production, they can become a really big problem, and because of our wonderful warm climate down here in the south, they're a problem throughout the production season, although they do uh, hide during the uh, summertime. It gets too hot for them. So this is the life cycle of our pest insect, and the adults can actually be quite long-lived for an insect. They can live up to 186 days, and it takes about 50 to 70 days, I think, for most crucifer crops to get to maturity, so they can be around just as long as the crucifer plants are, and a female, single female, can lay up to 200 eggs. Their eggs are bright orange, but not easy to find. They like to lay them on the soil surface or under leaf litter in places that are very concealed. They like to go right around the edge of the pots in my colony. And then the larvae hatch out. The small larvae uh, aggregate together, and then once they get bigger, they start to spread out. And they're larvae for about 13 days, and then they pupate. And their pupae actually looks like frass, which is the scientific term for insect poop. And the pupae also are like to be in more concealed places too, although I did encounter them on leaves occasionally. It wasn't very many. And then they become adults again, so they can go through this life cycle several times during the course of a cropping season. And they are quite voracious in terms of chewing up leaves. They do have a distinct host preference, and you can see in this picture, that's what they did to some Napa cabbage in one of my control plots a few years back, and in between those two ro rows of cabbage, there actually was a row of mustard planted that they completely destroyed. I think in the background, you can see some of the remaining stems maybe sticking out there, but yeah, that was what they did to my cabbage. Clearly, none of that is marketable, and it's quite ugly. We, we have determined that they prefer some cruciferous plants over others, and turnip is one of their most preferred host plants. And so one of the big things we've been doing is looking at turnip as a trap crop. That was a major part of the webinar last year, and it's proven very effective, especially with crops like cabbage that are not anywhere near as attractive as the turnip. With Crops they also really like, like the Japanese greens and the Napa cabbage, you need other tactics as well as the trap crop, but it is a useful tactic in the IPM strategy even with those crops. In terms of other management options, the main OMRI approved insecticide is in trust, and I have one grower that I'm in contact with that uses an entrust pyganic rotation to some effect, but he's more than happy to let me do research on his farm, giving him some more options because he hates these guys and not the insecticides, the beetles. And pyganic is somewhat effective. It's useful in a rotation, but not so much by itself. And there aren't very many known natural enemies of these guys. There's a stink bug that they found in its native country of Brazil. And our Dr. Ron Cave from here at UF has done a lot of work 
using the spine soldier bug to control the yellow margin leaf beetle with some success, and that was another major piece of the last webinar. So with our research, we've come up with an IPM strategy to implement. One of the big parts of that is using the turnip as a trap crop and then utilizing in trust to reduce the beetle population in the turnip so that it doesn't move from the turnip into the cash crop. One of the nice things about the yellow margin leaf beetle's behavior is it will chew its preferred crop to the ground before moving into into the cash crop, so that's a helpful part of its behavior and why trap cropping is so effective for them. Um, we're also looking at attractant baited traps as a useful monitoring tool, and uh, Rao is going to talk about that in his part of the presentation. As I said, uh, Dr. Cave talked a lot about the spying soldier bug in the last webinar. We did want to incorporate it using it as the biological control in the cash crop and then spraying OMRI approved insecticides as a last resort. So as a preliminary study, I basically compared this IPM strategy in three plots compared to three plots that I treated as a standard, which in the case of this grower was spraying the beetles within trust when they showed up, up to is it two or three times a season that, it, that that's allowed on the label. And so this was my plan for the IPM strategy. I planted the turnips two weeks before the cash crop all around the border of my three rows of Napa cabbage. And then I was going to spray and trust when the beetle population reached one per plant in the trap crop. I intended to release spine soldier bug at the first sign of yellow margin leaf beetle presence in, in the Napa cabbage. That was what Dr. Cave recommended. And the way that he recommended doing it is you can either order eggs or adults from the suppliers. And so he recommended ordering eggs and then rearing the eggs out into the first in star larvae, letting them hatch, and then releasing the larvae actually into the plots. I also had three traps in my plots to monitor the population. So those are the X's that you can see on the screen. I had two on the out side of the plot right next to the corner of the trap crop and then I had one in the middle and then I was planning on applying Grandivo if the yellow margin leaf beetle population in the Napa cabbage exceeded one per plant but sometimes the best laid plans of mice and men do not go well and so what actually happened I was able to plant the turnip plants two weeks before two weeks before the cabbage but almost a month later than I wanted to because we happened to have a fairly cold February. What well, wouldn't have been cold enough to heart the plants if they were established, but if you have a frost right after you transplant, that can shock and, and kill them. So I had to keep waiting through these cold snaps, and so it was the beginning of March when I finally got my cabbage planted, the turnips I planted at the end of February. And because I planted so late, the beetle showed up immediately, and so by April 1st, when it started to get really warm, I had to imply and trust to actually everything because I had beetles in the IPM plots and none of, neither of the insectaries could ship spine soldier bugs to me. It was going to be like two or three weeks before I got my spine soldier bugs, so that wasn't helpful either. And so I had to knock the population down or they were just going to build up and destroy everything. And then on April 15th, I applied the entrust to the standard plots and then to the trap crop, but not to the IPM plots. And I released the spine soldier bugs, but they didn't really establish that actually a lot of them died once they hatched, which I don't think was the fault of the insect company. I just... I don't know if I didn't give them the right food or if my, the environmental chamber wasn't set right or what happened, but apparently it's not as easy to keep them alive as I thought it was going to be. So in terms of the results, this is my data from the trap crop, the turnip, and one of the things that I thought was interesting, the arrows are where I sprayed the entrust, and I thought it was really interesting that after that first application, it knocked down the larval population, that's the blue line, and I didn't really see 
any larvae after that, the adult population pretty much stayed steady right around that threshold of one per plant. It did drop a little bit after the second application, but it was still up there, and the damage rating increased some from the beginning of the season, but fluctuated. I didn't have a huge beetle population, as you can see, from the uh, y-axis was having maximums of, you know, two beetles per plant, maybe. In terms of the actual Napa cabbage compared between the different plots, you can see the first application of Entrust kept everything the same. The red line is the adults in the IPM treatment. The orange is the adults in that standard treatment, which was just implying and applying Entrust to the things. The dark blue line is the larvae in the IPM treatment, and then the more aqua blue is the larvae in the standard treatment. And I never saw very many larvae in the standard treatment, and it wasn't until the end of the season that they started showing up in the IPM treatment because my spine soldier bug didn't establish, so there was nothing to control them, and that also caused the, at least some of this increase here. Now, there was no statistically significant difference between the two treatments, which is a very positive sign. And, of course, finding a better tactic than the spine soldier bugs that didn't work or improving that would help. And I have another reason that I suspect that this was a little bit higher than in than, than that I suspect that the adults, there were higher numbers of adults in the... IPM treatments versus the standard treatments, though four beetles compared to two isn't huge. And you can see the damage rating essentially did the same thing, staying consistent among the two treatments until the end, and it was only actually statistically different on that last date. So one of the things that I think was happening and causing problems is what's called trap spillover. And this is when a trap attracts a pest but it doesn't catch it, and so that results in increased damage to the nearby host plants. And this is an issue with Japanese beetles. The females are attracted to the general area of the trap, and then they find the host plants around it and start eating the host plants, and then the males who are seeking mates find these females. And I think something similar was happening with the yellow margin leaf beetles because I had that one trap in the middle of the plot, and I think that might have been attracting beetles into the plot. So I am hoping to repeat this on this farm. I have It's a very small organic farm, so I only have space for two treatments, and I'm not going to have that trap in the middle. And we're also doing another experiment where we actually have a separate treatment with just traps to try and tease out exactly what was going on with them, because they're a great monitoring tool. We just need to figure out how to place them properly so that they're not bringing beetles into our fields. So some of the lessons that I learned from this preliminary experiment were that the current release methods for spine soldier bugs are definitely impractical. So that's something that we need to work on. I think that'll be a useful tool, but we just need to get it to the point where it's easy to do and also having a sure supply of it would be helpful. The turnip is the trap crop works well in an integrated system. I didn't have any problems with that and applying entrust to it. And the entrust also works well, but we need to bring more OMRI-approved insecticides into that because we don't want the beetles to become resistant to entrust. That would be a huge problem. And we have our traps, which are a useful monitoring tool, but the placement of these traps is very important, and as I said, we're going to do some experiments this year to help us figure that out. So this is the updated strategy that I came up with. Again, the turnip is the trap crop with entrust application at the threshold of one beetle per plant, traps only on the field edges, and then rotation of entrust with other OMRI-approved compounds once that threshold of one beetle per plant is reached. And we're hoping to do some research on um, the threshold also and getting a more accurate number than just one, but that's our threshold that we're using right now and seems to work pretty well. 
So with that, I'm going to let Raoul talk about some of the more, uh, some of the details of our, our tactics. Uh, thank you, Elena. Uh, thank you, everyone attending this webinar. Um, I will be presenting on some of the recent work we did um, in evaluating OMRI approved insecticides and also um, attractant lure that we have developed to monitor yellow margin leaf beetle. So last several years, we evaluated uh, many um, organically acceptable materials um, Agnes yellow margin leaf beetle. Um, these materials include uh, botanical insecticides and uh, microbial insecticides and also uh, some of the physical um, materials like uh, surround. Um, here are some of those materials. Um, the Moltex, he is uh, one of the botanical insecticide. Um, it derived from the neem, neem tree, it has a active ingredient called agar directin. Um, neem based products uh, basically they work in two, uh, two ways to control the insects. One, they act as a um, anti-feedant, that means it, um, it, deter, it deters the uh, feeding damage of the insects and also um, they act as a growth regulator, meaning um, they prevent the immature insects to reach maturation. Um, it's very uh, active, I mean, very uh, commonly used in botanical insecticide for most of the insects, insect control. The second one is a pyganic. It's also a botanical insecticide. It has um, active ingredient has pyrethrin. Pyrethrin is a neurotoxin. It has a quick knockdown effect on insects, and it is a, it's a broad spectrum insecticide. Um, this one is also widely used in organic production. Um, here is um, Spenosad, is a uh, the trade name um, for organically uh, approved formulation of Spenosad. Um, is, this one is a, a fermented product of a naturally occurring bacteria. Um, the Spenosad or Entrust is um, highly um, act to against a large number of insects, including caterpillars, um, thrips, and also uh, beetles. Um, then another microbial insecticide is a Microtrol. It's a fungal formulation. It is um, contains Bavaria bassiana, which is a um, entomopathogenic fungi. Um, this particular fungus is very specialized to cause uh, diseases in insects. Um, the other microbial insecticide here is the Grandiva. Grandiva is um, a relatively very recent uh, microbial insecticide that has been registered as a AMRI approved material. Um, the Grandiva has a, a bacterial formulation called Chromatobacterium substrugi. This is um, the formulation contains some of the fermentation product of this bacteria and also other active ingredients. The last one is a uh, kaolin clay. It is a naturally occurring clay. The trade name for this material is uh, Surround. Um, the kaolin clay has a very uh, unique mode of action. This is, a, um, this is like a fine powder. Uh, when you mix it in the water and spray it on the plant, it creates a very thin film on the plant surface that makes, a, in, that, makes that, that prevents the insects um, uh, that acts as a physical barrier for insects um, to eat on the plants and also um, it also masks the color of the plant so that um, the insects uh, that can disrupt the uh, finding behavior of insects. So these are the materials we, we tested in the, one of the recent study that we have conducted. Um, these are the, some of the treatments uh, we have evaluated here. You can see the entrust, like uh, Elena mentioned, entrust is a very uh, popularly used uh, material against this beetle in this area. Um, the, the growers use the entrust uh, in a continuous, uh, uh, you know, continuous spray every week. Most of the time, there is, it is used in the weekly intervals. So we compared the grower standard as a positive control against other uh, treatments 
um, like here we, we here you can see the grand UI as a standalone and also we we did the uh, rotation with uh, uh, different materials. Uh, for instance, here we rotated Grandiva with the interest, um, and we also tested the tanks mixes uh, of two, two or three insecticides. For instance, here we we tank mixed, um, we tested the tank mix of Moltex, which is a neem product um, at full recommended rate with uh, slow acting, uh, 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 slow acting microbial insecticide Microtol. So I want to remind you, we applied, in case of rotation, um, we applied in the first insecticide, the Grandiva in this case, only when insects reach the threshold level. And then, the followed by the second insecticide here at the end trust, uh, if, the, if the population of the beetle reaches the threshold again. But if, if the population is below threshold of one insect per plant, we didn't apply the insecticide. Sorry. All right. This is my field layout for um, Amri uh, approved insecticide evaluation. Um, the experiment was um, conducted in a randomized complete block design. Um, the experiment plots are 25 feet long and 2.5 feet wide. Um, the, the treatment plots were replicated four times. Um, the, the, the plots were evaluated at weekly interval by sampling five randomly selected plants um, from each plot for adults and larvae and also we evaluated the damage, the feeding damage caused by the insects um, based on a scale of one to six. Um, here the one represents the very light defoliation whereas six is a complete defoliation. Then data was analyzed with ANOVA and the means was separated with Tukey Kramer HST analysis. The coming to results, um, here you can see the efficacy of some of those materials that we tested against adult beetles. Um, I want to mention here that I didn't present, uh, I didn't present all the data um, of the material that we tested. Um, uh, we, I only presented those that performed well against the beetle, just to simplify the graph. I know still it is too many lines and they're very confusing, um, but don't worry, I will walk you through this graph and, um, and uh, briefly tell you uh, what the important message from this. Here the x-axis represents the sampling dates and y-axis is the mean number of adults per plant per week. Um, the dotted line here represents the nominal economic threshold of one beetle per plant. Um, like I mentioned, the, the green is a positive control, which is the interest, and the black is um, the control plot, un untreated control plot. That means the plots that are not applied in insecticides. Now, for the unique mode of action of the surround, um, we applied the surround before onset of the beetle activity. Um, in this case, we applied the surround here on 24th of September. Um, then for all other insecticides, we only applied when they are, the population of the beetles are above economic threshold. Um, for instance, on October 15th, we applied, the, we treated all the plots with insects that accept um, the plot that contains the treatment of surround followed by interest. Um, similarly, on October 22nd, we applied only on the plots um, uh, on surround and, uh, and then Grandiva followed by interest. Only these two plots were treated with um, th those particular treatments, but other, tr other plots, they were not applied because the economic threshold was, uh, the beetle population was lower than economic threshold. Same is the case in case of uh, November 7th. Insects applied only when the threshold, uh, the population reaches the threshold. So the, the summary of this graph is, uh, sh the result shows that the rotating Grandivo, Paganic and Surround with the interest is as effective as 
a continuous period of the interest, which is the grower's treatment. Um, and also, the surround delayed the colonization of the beetle for almost for two weeks after application. So this is a really a great uh, information for the for managing um, the resistance for this beetle against the interest because that is what growers currently using to control the beetle. So this information will be very helpful um, to recommend uh, further um, options for the growers. So in, in terms of uh, larval, um, in terms of the efficacy against the larvae, it shows the similar results. Um, the rotation of other materials like uh, Grandiva Pyganic and Surround with interest was equally um, effective as application of the Surround. Uh, there is no any significant difference, but it is significantly different from untreated control plot. Similarly, the lower number of adults and larvae on those um, treatments resulted in significantly less crop damage when compared to untreated control plots. Here you can see the damage in treatment plots are almost less than 1 on the damage rating scale, whereas a maximum of 3.5 in control plots. So this picture shows the crop damage. Um, of the treated plots, uh, treated versus control plot. Um, here you can see uh, the turnips that are treated with surround um, in the before beetle activity and then followed by interest compared to the other treatments like a Moltex and the Microtrol, which is slow acting um, treatments. Uh, there was no any difference between this treatment and the untreated control. The damage, the beetle significantly damaged these crops, um, whereas little or no damage in the crop treated with the surround followed by interest. So in summary, uh, rotating interest with other materials is as effective as a grower standard of continuous application of interest. Um, like I said, that is really a very important um, thing in case of uh, delaying resistance of these insects to interest. Um, secondly, the pre application of surround um, before beetle, act beetle activity in the crop has uh, delayed the colonization of the beetle. Um, it might be because surround might have acted as a uh, created an unsuitable surface on the plant for the beetles uh, either to feed or to lay their eggs on the plant surface. But one thing to consider when you are applying the surround is um, the the thorough coverage of the plant when you are spraying it has to it has the the spray has to cover very well otherwise um, it may not work as effectively as we wanted it to be uh, and also um, the weather has a major impact on the success with the surround if it rains after you spray the surround there would be no any effect of that uh, treatment the final is the slow acting materials such as moltex which is a name product, and also Microtrol um, were not effective against uh, this beetle. So the coming to my uh, second topic, that's um, um, developing a monitoring uh, lure, uh, monitoring system for yellow margin leaf beetle. So like Elena mentioned, the yellow margin leaf beetle shows a strong preference to certain crucifer host plants. Um, we looked at uh, the chemistry of those, uh, the preferred and uh, less preferred host plants uh, to possibly to see if there is any, the chem chem chemistry it can lead us to give us some clue why they are more attractive. And we luckily found some of those um, crucifer crop uh, based uh, chemicals like isothiocyanates that uh, are responsible for attraction of these beetles to those particular plants, the highly preferred plants. So then we, we synthesized those chemicals and developed as a lure and optimized those, the, uh, the blends of the, uh, for um, yellow margin leaf beetle attraction in the laboratory test. Then finally, we evaluated those blends in, in the field by using dead in yellow pyramid traps um, for leaf beetle. 
So here is the picture of uh, dead end pyramid trap that we used. Um, this is about seven, 17 inch tall and um, six and a half, six and quarter inch wide. Um, we choose in this particular trap because um, it is uh, almost the same height as most of the crucifer crops uh, that the growers grow and this uh, beetle attack. Um, and also the yellow color of the, is shown to be attracted to most of the similar beetles, similar crucifer beetles. For instance, um, flea beetle were attracted to the yellow color. So we haven't tested the color attraction to this particular beetle, but we thought yellow color could be a, a, a attractive color uh, for this beetle. And finally, this uh, trap is readily available in the market. So they normally use this one for um, sting bug trap. Um, so it is available in the market. So that's why we used this particular trap to adapt for the leaf beetle uh, studies. So this is my field layout. Um, we tested the traps with lure versus the new, no lure and it installed the traps uh, on the field border um, and monitor the traps at weekly intervals for adult beetle uh, in the plot in the in the traps. So here is the data uh, that uh, for the one of the study we did in the 2012. Um, the x-axis again says uh, uh, sampling dates and uh, y-axis is mean number of beetles per trap per week. Um, the trap cache on the, um, was ranged from zero to all the way to 40 beetles per 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 trap. Um, but on the average, the traps cache to the maximum of five beetles per trap. So here you see the green color is uh, the trap with uh, attractant blend, and whereas the red red bars are with control traps. So the traps baited with a lure captured almost twice um, as many as the beetles with uh, beetles, uh, as many beetles than the, the unbaited traps. So we further optimized the lure and um, we did uh, more studies, field evaluation of these lures. And this is the recent study we did in 2015. Um, you can see here, um, the trap cache in uh, with baited traps is almost, you know, five to ten, five times or more than the traps with no bait. Um, they are significantly different from um, control traps are on the even on the crop crop plants. For instance, the green, the yellow color represents the napa cabbage plant or crop, which has, which has a uh, less than one. Um, on them, but the trap catch almost um, one beetle per trap. So it looks like the the lure is pretty uh, good um, in attracting the beetle, and um, it could be a, a a potential tool for uh, in IPM. So I just show I will just show the video of the the trap catch in one of my uh, trap. So here are the leaf uh, low margin leaf beetles. Um, this trap catch almost um, more than 20 beetles uh, in a week. So in summary, um, plant-based synthetic lure is highly attractive to adult beetles, and um, it can be used as a monitoring tool to manage this pest. Um, currently, we are working to commercialize this lure and make it available to the growers so that they can use as a monitoring tool to manage this pest. So with that, I will pass on to Dr. Ayanava Majundar uh, for his uh, presentation. All right, I am going to take control from here. All right, um, I'm the last speaker here in the series, and uh, I hope you guys have been enjoying uh, uh, listening to this wonderful conversation. And I've been writing some notes, so if you hear uh, papers moving in the back, that's because I'm a note writer and I've been writing notes and I, ha I hope that you all uh, listeners are out there writing as well. Um, I'm going to kind of summarize uh, things that you have heard and 
and uh, because I try to develop some uh, IPN resources, so you'll hear some uh, about uh, new publications and stuff. But uh, again, this OEI funding, and one of the major things we are doing is taking this information out to producers. And uh, you know, so we are teaching the new producers who want to know about uh, you know, cold crop production, um, insect pests, and of course, yellow margin leaf beetle is a big problem in Alabama um, and Florida, as you all saw from the pictures. Uh, we are also teaching um, the methods to experienced producers. Uh, through our field demonstrations and um, indoor talks. The whole idea is to help farmers develop site-specific IPM plans. And that's something that um, I'm big on, and I work with farmers one-on-one -on -one to develop these site-specific IPM plans. Uh, and, uh, and the overall goal is to save money, save input, uh, and increase farm profits. Um, so let me jump into this last few slides. Uh, this is kind of uh, a slide for educators that are out there, and it shows the inner workings of our IPM, um, uh, the IPM program, uh, the Alabama Vegetable IPM program, and you can find this information on my website. Uh, but this is really the education model we use. Uh, it all starts with step one, which is information transfer. Uh, I also call it technology awareness, where we tell the farmer about uh, here's the technology like you are doing right now. You're learning about new techniques and uh, uh, really a basic information. From that, we take farmers to the field, uh, to our demonstration fields, usually on our research farms, and actually show big plots of how we have uh, taken the research from small plots to big plots. And that's more convincing uh, for a lot of producers. Uh, then the hard part is the step three and step four uh, on the slide. Uh, step three is where the farmer adopts a certain technology, uh, and we have we are there. Uh, extension is there uh, to help uh, refine the technology and really help answer some of the questions uh, for producers. And finally, if the producer is happy, if the educator is happy, if everything works as a, as expected, you have full technology adoption, which is the final step, and that's where the money saving can happen. And we also have a pretty elaborate evaluation system. We are constantly monitoring what we are doing out there. And if farmers tell us that we want this, we can rapidly change our technology, uh, or we can rapidly change our delivery system for the technology and adapt to the farms. Uh, this is a, a just one slide on uh, for one of the uh, locations we have where we have this on a pretty sizable uh, uh, scale, you can see trap crops uh, of, of turnips on the outer edges of this field, and we have uh, cabbages that were planted two weeks uh, late. Uh, so you can see the rapid growth of the turnips. You can also see water in my plots, just because we have been having a lot of rain recently. A lot of rain, we get a lot of rain in our winters, so we have so we def definitely felt a lot of problems treating these plots, uh, but those turnips were uh, torn apart by the yellow margin leaf beetle, and we have not seen the yellow margin leaf beetle on the cabbages there. So it's pretty incredible to see it on this scale. Um, another thing uh, is, you know, we are trying to show farmers that we can truly integrate different strategies. For example, you can also use monitoring systems, like Dr. Balusu was saying. Uh, right now, because that is under development for yellow margin leaf beetle, we have a bunch of traps for monitoring caterpillars on our cabbages, because that is a big issue also besides uh, yellow margin leaf beetle. So again, remember that you, um, uh, truly speaking, in the field, you'll have uh, all these different insects attacking your crops, and you have to think of, of, of control methods on a very broad scale. And uh, again, think back to the slide where I had those three levels of management mentioned, and you have to really see how, which ones fit your needs uh, and how you can be uh, most profitable. But that's a picture of our plots. Um, just wanted to mention that well, you saw those pheromone traps out there. We actually uh, share that information, uh, the insect monitoring information with our clients. Uh, especially educators and crop consultants who work with us through this software. It's called MyTraps uh, that has been developed by Spencer Technologies out of Indiana. And we have kind of tweaked uh, 
uh, help tweak this program to benefit the Alabama producers, but most of our trap data is on there, and educators uh, can use the cell, the cell phone uh, app to actually see some of the insect traps. So the reason I have it here is once we have the monitoring system for yellow margin leaf beetles in place, we can actually add the insect to our database and share this information uh, in real time across Alabama um, and, and benefit the producers. And on the slide, I have shown you uh, a little screenshot of how uh, it generates, this software generates uh, statewide maps with insect catches. And that's the one for cabbage looper, which is a major, another major insect pest uh, for, uh, um, for Alabama in, in the coal crops. Uh, so these are really good technologies out there that we are trying to integrate and use. Um, for teaching farmers, of course, we do a lot of indoor presentations. We also do um, two-hour workshops where we introduce a variety of pests, including yellow margin leaf beetle, to our producers. I've done quite a few um, uh, scout schools uh, outside, and uh, this is a, a screenshot um, or photograph, two photographs of of me speaking at those blocks uh, that you saw earlier. Uh, but really, I think a lot of the advanced learning happens on these uh, on the field, and that's really convincing for producers. Now, uh, when producers do it on the farm, and as I said, I know the real happiness that I derive from my work is when farmers use the technologies. Uh, and here are some farmers who are actually using the technologies. I think the slide just went back. but. Uh, Again, the whole goal is to provide farmers uh, real-time advice. So when they call, um, I'm there to answer the phone call and really develop those site-specific IPM plans and motivate producers for organic certification. Um, I think it's a real um, educational tool to be organically certified. It's good for marketing the crop. Um, now let's kind of look back on what you have heard about the yellow margin leaf beetle. And uh, I'm kind of trying to summarize um, my uh, the, all the information now. Uh, so remember, when you're scouting for the yellow margin leaf beetle, don't wait too long once you have seen one adult, because there are going to be other adults in the vicinity, even if you can't see them. Remember, insects are very good at jumping off the plants when you walk. So uh, be smart about that. Try to outsmart the pests and keep looking. And remember, the threshold for yellow margin leaf beetle is really low because they go through several generations and uh, especially if you're farming in the south, the warm um, and humid climate is perfect for this insect. Remember the host preference? Uh, it really likes turnips and Nepa cabbage, and we have seen that in our uh, demonstration plots as well. And it's very interesting that in, on Nepa cabbage, um, I was having this conversation with Dr. Balasu, and it appears that the adults uh, like Nepa cabbage um, uh, because they like to get some, some shelter from the weather, and uh, probably some from the natural enemies. So uh, turnip being a more open canopy, it's harder. So you'll see both turnip and neighbor cabbage uh, pretty hardly attacked uh, or uh, uh, high damage on these, these crops. So look for early defoliation. And as Dr. Balasi said, that we are developing a, a synthetic lure. So hopefully uh, that will be available to producers soon. Again, prevention is better than cure, and you have uh, heard this a hundred times, I bet. But in organic systems, you have to prevent because you can't wait for the insect um, to establish, and uh, the products are, uh, are, could be expensive, or they could give you uh, poor control in many cases. So uh, try to prevent pest establishment. And one thing that you have to remember is field sanitation, very important cultural practice. Uh, as soon as you're done with your uh, crop, uh, clean the field. Don't let the insects build up uh, in your field. And also remember, larvae are more susceptible uh, to the temperatures, um, although they don't move much. Uh, but they, the adults will fly um, and, and can repopulate. So again, the weather is an important factor. And try to conserve natural enemies. And one of the best ways you can do that is to cut back on the use of uh, insecticides, uh, time them right, um, uh, and direct the applications on the insect so that you get maximum efficacy. And I think um, I borrowed the pictures here from Dr. Donald Cave's uh, slides from last year. Uh, he's the 
um, entomologist at University of Florida, and uh, he, uh, if you want to learn more about natural enemies, please look at that slideshow um, and the and the video archive video. Um, there's no more uh, to talk about uh, trap cropping. You have already seen enough evidence about trap crops. It works great, but again, remember the threshold for controlling the ins uh, insect uh, is is very low. So keep scouting the trap crop. Uh, you cannot go on a vacation with a trap crop because it is going to draw in the insects. So keep monitoring, uh, keep scouting, and uh, we have a turnip to cabbage uh, ratio here, which is one is to five, which is based on our uh, on our experiments and those demonstration plots you saw. Uh, but I think the best recommendation I have for you is to do this on your farm and see what works and be your own judge at what kind of pressure you have uh, of this insect. And then develop the trap crop system. I have seen uh, farmers with trap crops uh, who evolve their own system. They have developed their own system, are very smart about it. They know where the insects are, and they control the insect timely on the trap crop. So again, uh, remember that trap crop, doing the trap crop uh, is could take some time. It takes more management. So plan ahead. Um, Dr. Balasu already talked about the uh, birational insecticides, and he talked quite a bit about those products, so I'm not going to uh, talk again, but as I was listening, I was checking on some of the labels for these insecticides, and I found out that uh, Entrust, I think, has a new, newer label. There's a newer label online, and uh, you can check the rate of application there, but there is a limit to how much you can apply. Uh, the label specifically says do not apply more than two uh, consecutive sprays uh, of Entrust to avoid resistance issues. Uh, so again, you have these other options uh, to use so that you can rotate and, um, and do your best to hit the insects directly. Um, also remember, none of these insects or insecticides will move in the plants. Uh, most of them don't, So, which means that you have to reapply as the plant grows. So uh, have a good uh, coverage, and that's very important for uh, for using organic insecticides. And do not overspray because you need to protect those natural enemies. And believe me, um, I have done enough studies and demonstrations where I have uh, killed them intentionally, and then you can see what happens. The pests take over the plants. So. Um, uh, definitely, you need to protect these natural enemies and rotate insecticides to avoid resistance. And best is check the label before you use. Uh, just quickly to summarize uh, uh, some of the resources we have, uh, we do have a new publication from Alabama Extension. It's called Insect Pest Scouting for Crucifer Crops. Uh, if you need to get a copy, a printed copy, uh, you can email me, and my email is on the slide, following slides. Uh, or you can download this as PDF online. It's really nice with some beautiful insect pictures. Uh, we also have some new resources for beginning farmers, and uh, we have the High Tunnel uh, Crop Production Handbook, which has several new IPM chapters and the IPM slide chart. And in Alabama, I insist that producers have a copy of that IPM slide chart in their hand when they're calling me for pest problems. If you need a copy of this, please email me. My email address is on the presentation. We also have an IPM newsletter. You can subscribe uh, to it. It's free. Uh, very, little, very few things in life are free, but this is free. And you can read it on mobile devices. Please go to the website up there, Alabama IPM Communicator, or just Google. And there's an electronic subscription system. Uh, very easy. All we need is your email. This is the website, um, the Ve Alabama Vegetable IPM website, and the most beautiful thing that's on there are those IPM training modules. If you're looking on your screen, you will see that uh, as your fifth option there, there is a training module on yellow margin leaf beetle that I've organized. And you can look at that. Uh, that includes videos and publications together. And there are six other training modules. So that's a really popular thing on my website, and we really work hard to keep this website updated. So please use this pro, uh, website and subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, we are also on Facebook because uh, there are 2 billion people on Facebook, so we are on Facebook. 
and that's a really good, great way to share information, uh, especially once we have the monitoring system in place and have more recommendations. We are going to write about it and uh, send the information out through Facebook. So please join us on Alabama Vegetable IPM on Facebook. Um, with that, I'm going to close my presentation. I would uh, uh, just like to acknowledge my uh, co-presenters here today and all the wonderful work they do. Uh, again, thanks to Alice at eOrganics for, for uh, organizing this, this webinar. And we're very thankful to growers, our funding agency, uh, the wonderful field staff uh, at the University Farms, um, and my assistant, Ann Chambliss, and my student assistants who do a lot of work with the IP newsletter and sharing this information out to producers. Uh, with that, I am going to um, uh, close and um, I think, Alice, I am ready for you to take over. Okay. Thank you very much, all three presenters. Um, we're about to begin our question and answer session. So for anyone who missed the very beginning of this presentation, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and hit return. Um, and if that question box isn't open, you can click the small plus sign or on a Mac, a triangle next to the word question, and that will open it up. Um, I also wanted to mention that we really value your feedback, so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out the follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email later today. This webinar was recorded, um, and you'll be able to find it on our website in our webinar archive, where you can also find the previous webinar that this group did on um, the yellow margin leaf beetle. So, um, also, if after the webinar you have general questions about organic farming, um, you're welcome to use the e-extension Ask an Expert service. So um, let me see if anyone has typed in questions. Um, if you have a question, don't be shy, um, because um, we'll probably have time to get them all answered. So someone just commented, yes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And um, Let's see, um, I just have one question here so far, but um, please feel free to type in more. Another person thanked you um, for all the links and resources. Um, so are trap crops sacrificial crops? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, I can go ahead and answer. This is Inava, and uh, I've done trap cropping uh, in various crops. Uh, a lot of my work has focused on uh, some of the summer crops. Uh, but um, I think that's a that's a great question. Is uh, what about trap crop? Is that sacrificial? Uh, yes, it is sacrificial because you are trying to get the insect to eat and stay there. Uh, it gives you the chance to um, you know distract them from your main crop. But I will also say, and and plus you're you're treating the trap crop. Don't forget that you are treating the trap crops. Uh, Having said that, it's it's also important to know that trap crops can pay for themselves. Uh, for example, in those case, in case of turnips, um, even if the uh, tops eaten, um, you can still sell the roots, I suppose, and uh, get back your money uh, to some extent. And we have seen that in some other trap crop system. Um, so the answer is yes and no. And I'll let Dr. Balasu, who has more experience on the turnips, to uh, chime in on this. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Dr. A. Um, the good thing with trap crop with turnips is even the foliage is completely, uh, if the crop is that crop is completely defoliated, you, the growers, most of the growers in this area, they still could able to sell the roots and um, you know make um, the money out of it. Um, so it's not necessarily to uh, complete you don't have to sacrifice the entire uh, trap crop in, in this instance. Okay. Well, um, if anyone has any more questions, let's just give you another minute to um, please type them in. Um, let's see. Um, see, we also, we just want to thank our funders. Um, the, um, this is this group is part of a um, USDA OREI grant on um, crucifer production in the South. So we just wanted to mention that one more time. And we will also be um, presenting more resources from this group um, on eOrganic and pointing them, pointing you to them in our newsletter um, as soon as we get word of them. So we will try to keep you as informed as possible about the progress of this project. Um, let's see. 
Um, okay, so somebody just wanted to, the person who asked the trap crop question um, basically said, so trap crops are essentially sacrificial, but some of them may be used and sent to the market. I believe that is what the presenter said um, in the case of turnips. So if we don't have any more questions, um, I'd like to thank our presenters um, for sharing this very useful and practical information with us today. Oh, here is one last question. We have one time, uh, we have time here. How does the overwintering biology of YLMB match with the seasonal variation in the growth of the trap crops? Well, I can answer that question very easily from Florida. We don't have enough of a winter down here to actually um, have any issue with that. We can essentially grow crucifer crops from sometimes October all the way through April. So, and the beetles there pretty much all year. We seem to see less of it in the fall months than we do in the in the spring months, but that probably, at least on the farm I was on, but that probably depends on the farm. So down here it matches very well because we don't have, an, we don't really have winter. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I just want to encourage everyone to check out our many upcoming and archived webinars on organic farming and research topics at the link on your screen. Um, next week we have two webinars, one on nitrogen management in strawberries um, from California. And then we also have one on milk production on fatty acids. Um, so um, you're welcome to attend those webinars. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Belusu, Dr. Majumdar, and Dr. Rhodes for sharing your work with us today. And thanks to everyone for joining us.